Hello, everyone. Uh, I just want to say sorry. We have a bit of an issue with the PowerPoint, but we'll work around it. <laughs> so our Chinese teacher, Ms. Tung, is the only one in the district. And she prepared us quite well with only a year of educating us in Mandarin to travel to China and learn in a language immersed environment. So between two schools and only two levels of classes, she teaches about 20 students in this city of approximately 10,000 people. And it seems kind of strange that an area which is so culturally diverse is seemingly disinterested in learning a language spoken by approximately a billion people. And that's exactly why we're speaking to you today, to elicit a demand. Seeing the Great Wall and eating good food was fun, but the real great thing about going to China was learning a language in an environment that we didn't have in New York. Every day for roughly 40 days, we spoke with natives about every imaginable topic, from animals to business to art, anything, and we learned without realizing it. Tossing a kid a worksheet will teach them memorization, but telling them to find a historic site without the crutch of technology will teach them so much more. As weeks passed in Beijing, I realized I didn't have to translate I'm sorry to sorry, Duibuchi, <laughs> whenever I bumped into someone on the subway anymore. And it felt natural speaking in a language that I hardly knew, which was a transition I could only make through language immersion. However, I now have to catch myself whenever I bump into someone in the hallways at school speaking Chinese rather than English. Language immersion techniques, even in a lab, have proven to be more effective in not only teaching the language, but teaching how to process that language natively. A study conducted by the University of Chicago found that subjects uh, immersed in a language had brain functions far more similar to native speakers than those who were in a classroom. So I'm wondering, why are we using classrooms? Not only can you learn, but you have the capacity to relearn and improve always. No one can just go out and travel anywhere they want to be in a language immersed environment anytime, but everybody has the ability to go on Facebook or on a forum to find a friend with whom they can practice their language. It's once you start changing your language settings on your computer that you really mark the start of self-initiated and self-motivated learning. So, I'm sure some of you remember the Muzzy series of language learning videos. And for those of you who don't, they were entirely in the target language, such as French, and were just simple children's cartoons. No translations, no textbooks, no worksheets, just the language and something kids like, cartoons. So I'm wondering, why has education strayed from this path? Children are almost only interested in learning things in a way they enjoy, not in a classroom and not with textbooks. So our teacher has certainly noticed this, enveloping us in Chinese newspapers, books, movies, poems, songs, and history to both pique our interests and to make our learning habits more organic and familiar. The strangest thing is, contrary to what the last 50 years of education in the US has enforced, multifaceted education works. Everyone has heard a kid say, when will I ever use this in reference to math? I'm the last person to ask when it comes to educating anyone on math, but almost any teacher or parent can say to a student, young or old, there's a bit of practicality in learning language. I see this realization happening every day, and at school now, they're planning a trip to go to France and Spain, which is great because it allows children in our schools practicing their second or third language to go to an environment foreign to them in order to practice and learn. I just hope that more people to begin to realize this and share these opportunities with others because a community that is more diverse is often more educated and thus more prosperous. So although in our community we may think stereotypically of the smart Asians, the root of this archetype actually goes back to Chinese primary education, from elementary school to high schools. The rigorous classes they take lead to a very strong and hard worth ethic, which in turn leads to a very competitive class ranking and standard of high grades that's important to everybody. 
And in the end of this, in the end of their high school careers, much like we do, they take an entrance exam like the SATs, but this will decide whether they get the upper education at a top university or go down the path through vocational school to become workers, farmers, or technical personnel. However, many young Chinese do have the ambition to study abroad, and while in Beijing, it wasn't difficult to see the familiar colors of Harvard, Yale, Penn State on t-shirts throughout the city streets. In fact, in 2010 and 2011, 56,976 young Chinese became undergraduates at American universities. Many people as aspired to do this and go beyond their Chinese education to American university education. So in the upper education department, the US must be doing something right. And for these young prospective exchange students, they must have some English under the belt in order to pass their English as a foreign language exam. But also many foreigners in general realize that in today's age, learning English is very important. And so teaching begins at one to two years old. Whereas in America, we don't start our foreign language studies until about the sixth grade when we're almost teenagers. Here, American education takes a great turn for the worse. The American ignorance takes hold, and while we expect foreigners to learn our language, we push learning theirs off to a side until an age where it's not as easily grasped and it's ultimately forgotten about. So while, thank you, while in Beijing, we were able to teach Chinese middle, middle school students at Beijing's Dandelion School. The Dandelion School is a special school just for the children of migrants, workers, children, um, because the Chinese education follow a system called Huko. The Huko system states that a child must go to school in the same place that they were born in. And because migrants move from their hometown and their children's, finding education for them is nearly impossible. But thanks to the Dandelion School, they have a place to go. And although they aren't part of the regular system or won't get the same opportunities as other Beijingers do, they still put an emphasis on learning English. While we prepared lessons on food, animals, and school subjects, little did we know how much they actually knew. They could easily speak and write English as well as any third to fourth grade American student could, and they were just in the seventh grade. The Dandelion School kids, our language mentors, and the Chinese people we just met every day made an amazing impact on us, and they taught us a little bit about where we come from and the power of language. As well, Chinese is, Chinese society and China in general is increasing modern, their modernization every single day. So why don't we get more involved in China? We all know that the newer the iPhone, the newer technology for glass Corning Incorporated makes. And we all know that at Walmart we'll find something made from China. Actually 92% of the store is made in China. So why don't we get more involved with them? Why don't we increase our Chinese language instruction um, to get more students and at younger ages? Not only will this help increase Chinese education for future generations of individuals, it can help America as a whole create more and more connections, or as the Chinese call it, guanxi, to start adapting and working with a modern China. Thank you. Thank you. So during our five and a half weeks in China, we gained some very important cultural experiences. When we first arrived, we thought of ourselves as nuisances to the Chinese people. We had to constantly ask for directions and even help um, ordering off of menus. But by the end of our time there, we learned that they didn't think of us as nuisances. They liked to help us. One example that I can think of is one time when we were out exploring, we had to ask for directions on a map to get us there. We asked a man at a bus stop, and he pointed it out to us. And then when he realized we were still slightly confused, he went out of his way and guided us all the way to our destination and asked for nothing in return, even though we had caused him such an inconvenience. We were taking time to learn their language, and that's why they took time to help us. We weren't forcing them to learn our language. We wanted to learn theirs. As you all know, they have very rigorous education in China. When we were there, we were there during the last two weeks of their final exams. Um, as Amanda said before, um, 
these exams determined their placement in the future and their possible jobs. They demanded absolute peace and quiet from us. And when we were in the, when we were there, we weren't even allowed in the same buildings as them when they were testing. And if there was an exception made, we had to be separated by one to two floors. As Bronson said earlier, Miss Tung is an extraordinary teacher, but she's not able to teach an entire school district on her own. We're lobbying to increase Chinese education, and we've already picked up several new students. We hope this leads to the expansion of Chinese education into different grade levels and start from a younger age. People need to notice that we have a need for new teachers and we hope to influence educational opportunities by educating on the power of language and the power of learning. Xie xie, thank you. <laughs>